In this section, we're going to focus on macroevolution. Now, in reality, this is basically just microevolution given a bit more time to occur. Macroevolution is really just a way of looking at speciation. Speciation is a human construct where for our own benefit we try to group organisms into their own little packages and the package is known as a species. Now a species is just going to be where populations separate for long enough that they typically don't seem to interact with each other, at least not reproductively, when they meet back up. Now even this is kind of up in the air. Species is something that once again is more for us than for the actual organisms. So this concept of macroevolution is always going to be kind of steeped in a little bit of debate and argument because it's really just a way of deciding when two populations have become dissimilar enough that we can now classify them as two separate groups completely. Now in general, the way we determine species is will they in nature interbreed with each other successfully? And for us to get new species, the big thing we're going to discuss here is going to be population isolation. Because if two populations start to diverge, they can each start to undergo their own mutations, their own natural selection based upon their own environment, until eventually they become dissimilar enough that when they come back into contact, they normally see each other as either competition, or they might just see each other and just ignore each other. And so they do not see each other and think sexy time. They do not think like, I should mate with this thing. And even if they did think that, something would be going on that would prevent them from successfully mating, even if they tried in many cases. So this will be the really general big picture idea of macroevolution. You know, ultimately over time, go through your own changes like you see here. When you meet back up, you only recognize individuals that are like you as being the ones that you want to mate with. So this separation then persists. Now, there's two big ways that we can get separation. The first is prezygotic. Prezygotic is going to be something that makes it where you just do not mate successfully with the organism. So there's no pregnancy. Now this could be something that's simple where it's just there's a dance or some type of behavior or song that's required to get the female to mate with you. And so if you have a different dance or if you have a different mating call, then ultimately the female is going to ignore you. It could be differing the time at which you reproduce. Maybe one reproduces in the spring. A different species of the similar type is going to reproduce in the fall, and so ultimately you guys never actually line up in terms of reproduction. There's plenty of other things though that it could be. It could be actual physical stuff where your reproductive structures have changed, and so they don't actually like meet up successfully. It could be that you have a different enzyme present in the sperm because sperm cells have this little vacuole essentially we'll say that contains a bunch of enzymes called an acrosome. And it essentially dumps a bunch of these enzymes that digest this coat called a jelly coat that surrounds the actual ovum or egg or whatever you want to call it. And so if you lack the right enzyme, you're not able to break down that coating, which means the sperm can't actually get into the egg to impregnate it. So this is why even if a human ovum came in contact with sperm from another species, like you went swimming, you're not going to ultimately have a mermaid child or a lobster child because they're incompatible. This would be prezygotic. No zygote, that's the first cell that starts off the pregnancy. That's not going to happen prezygotically. Now, postzygotically, you can get a pregnancy. You can get the zygote. But either the resulting pregnancy terminates before it finishes, so essentially the fetus or the baby does not make it through to birth. That can happen in some cases. In other cases, you have fertility issues. So this is like a mule, or you'll see with a liger that we see on the picture here, uh, ligers ultimately tend to have some health issues and they tend to have fertility issues. And so if you're born but you can't reproduce either with other ligers or lions or tigers or anything essentially, you are now completely isolated and you're going to disappear. You know, that's not going to work. And then in some cases you get even where it's kind of neat that you can get with a first generation's fertile but then after that they break down. That's called a hybrid breakdown. So that ultimately in the long run you will not be able to retain he your health, you will not be able to retain your fertility. But occasionally it actually takes like a generation or two before this infertility or this poor health shows up. Either way we cannot for long periods of time continue to have these organisms live and successfully reproduce. So we still have isolation but in this case, it's just a bit more interesting where you do, in some cases, get an actual offspring or at least get a pregnancy so it appears as though it's working. Now, for speciation, there's, there's two broad ways you see people talk about it occurring. 
The simple way is allopatric. This is geographic isolation. Something occurs like a river, a mountain, a road, fencing. Something splits a population, the starting population, into two. And then the things on either side start to go through their own evolution, like we've talked about, their own natural selection, their own mutations. And so over time, we start to see these differences. You've got the green versus the yellow. And that way, when they come back into contact at a later point, they once again do not see each other as potential mates. And so at this point, we now have gotten where their speciation event has occurred by our most common definition of speciation. The next way is sympatric. So this one's interesting because this is where you get a separation in populations, but they both still live in the same place at the same time. So this can occur if, for instance, you had where a new mating behavior evolved. And so some of the individuals in this population are doing the new mating behaviors, and they're mating with the females that prefer that one, whereas other ones are doing the old behavior, and they're mating with the females that prefer the old behavior. And so over time now, we get these two populations, but it, we didn't have to physically separate them. Something occurred that allowed them to be separated, even though they're in the same place. And so then over time, you can get where they continue to evolve on their own because they're no longer mixing their genetics. And so they each get their own new mutations. They each have their own natural selection. And so given enough time, you can get to where you have two separate species now, but they evolved in the same place at the same time without a physical separation. There's instead a barrier that's going to be like time because they're breeding at different times or behavior, something to that effect. Now another cool concept that we see, and this ties in with Darwin and his finches, is we can oftentimes see this idea of an adaptive radiation. This is where one species, oftentimes this occurs on islands, so it would be from the mainland, manages to wind its way up on an island. And so in this case, you see species A makes it to the island. Now once it gets to the island, it starts to adapt to that island, so over time it speciates. So now we have species B, which is essentially A that's undergone plenty of change, so now we call it B. But then this species can continue to find its way to other islands that might be nearby. And on those other islands, you're going to see that there's different characteristics. And so it's going to continue then to evolve. So you start to get newer species. If you have a single island, you can sometimes see that that single island has various resources that are untapped. So even on the first island, you can start to see speciation because maybe one of them starts to try to go after the bigger seeds and the other one starts to kind of go after the smaller seeds because just due to natural variation, some had bigger beaks and smaller beaks. So they were kind of better suited to go after different types of seeds. And if they tend to hang around the different plants that produce those seeds, they might now be separated based on their habitat, even though they're on the same island. And so they start to breed with one another. And by one another, I mean just their group. And so over time, we now get this separation in the populations. We get adaptation. We ultimately get two new species. And then as this continues to go, where they can move kind of back and forth, so they can move to new islands. Some of the ones that evolve on these new islands can go back to the original island. And so we get this kind of constant shift until eventually we have a whole bunch of different species of one group. So in this case, you can have, you know, 15 species of finch, or you can have, you know, 40 different species of a particular type of flower that you find on the Hawaiian Islands. This happens very consistently on islands because they don't get that many different initial species that kind of make their way there, but the ones that do then tend to do this rapid divergence that allows them to produce a bunch of different species as they each specialize for their own food source, which allows them then to avoid competing with each other for things like food and places to live, etc. Now, coevolution goes with this fact that oftentimes things aren't evolving in isolation. They're evolving with something else. So you can have instances like with this flower, where the flower has a very long tube where their nectar's at the bottom. And so this has evolved with a particular type of moth that has a really, really, really long proboscis. This happened to be one that Darwin saw and predicted that we would find later on an insect that was a pollinator that had a crazy long proboscis, about 18 inches. We did eventually find in about 1903 this particular moth that did have an 18 inch long proboscis that allowed for it to get the nectar from this particular plant and pollinate it. So there's lots of these relationships and sometimes it's more of an arms race like the cheetah and the gazelle. Sometimes like with the flower and the moth they're actually working together because one gets food and one gets pollinated but there's many of these relationships where two organisms will work together and they'll evolve to either better suit each other or they'll evolve to better try to take advantage of one another, or in the case of prey, avoid one another. Now, when we talked about analogous structures, we said that that's called convergent evolution. And so convergent evolution is going to be one of these big 
ideas that allows for unrelated species to ultimately start to look the same because they live in a similar environment, they're trying to do similar things, and so it just so happens that there are particular traits that make it best to do that thing. And so it could be like we talked about, wings if you're going to fly, fins and being torpedo shaped if you're going to swim. Those ultimately are the best traits you can kind of end up at. And so most organisms that live in an aquatic environment develop fins and a torpedo shape. You know, most organisms that need to be up in the trees and potentially glide or fall or fly, they develop something like wings or webbing. If you happen to be a scavenger that lives in leaf litter on the floor of a forest, you're going to see there's kind of a nice little shape that works, and so you can be segmented a bunch of ways and have this general shape and be a millipede, like the pill millipede. Or you can be more like a roly-poly, pill bug, whatever you want to call them. Uh, but ultimately, these guys have a similar shape, but they're completely different. These are millipedes. They're essentially a myriapod. They're centipedes and millipedes. Whereas the pill bug is ultimately a crustacean. So it's actually more closely related Instead of insects, it's more closely related to like crabs and lobsters and such. And so these are two separate things that look very similar because of a similar environment. Just like down here, we've got a thalassine, which is essentially, it used to be called a, a, sometimes a Tasmanian tiger, or Tasmanian wolf, but it was a marsupial that served the same kind of niche as a wolf. So if you compare it to the gray wolf, you can see many similarities in the skull, in the general bone structure, despite the fact that this thing is a completely different type of mammal. You know, it's a marsupial versus the wolf is what we call a placental, kind of like us. So similar environments will ultimately breed many similar traits. Now, for a long time, people have described evolution as being more like the tortoise than the hare, this kind of slow, steady, gradual evolution. And we call that gradualism. And gradualism is shown here where you see there seems to be this kind of constant change, this kind of constant side to side and forward movement. The forward being time, but as you see it kind of wobble to the sides, that's where it's starting to change. But it's slow and steady. What we see with many organisms is that does not appear to be how this works. We oftentimes see that in nature there's rapid change because maybe the volcano went up, maybe there's a new invasive species, but something can occur and that change makes things rapidly respond or go extinct. And so that's where this idea of punctuated equilibrium comes from. This is more of the hare than the tortoise. This is where you see that evolution can occur very rapidly and then it can kind of slow down a little bit for certain periods where things are stable. And then there gets to be instability and it speeds up and it's rapid again, and then it gets to be stable. So if you see punctuated equilibrium, you can see where there's this rapid change, this rapid side to side movement, but then it can kind of appear to be mostly vertical. There'd still be some evolution here, but a lot slower pace. So this is much more of the hare, fast than slow, fast than slow, versus the tortoise is what we see with the gradualism idea that was the older idea. More and more we're seeing people kind of favor this punctuated equilibrium because many things in the fossil record show this. You know, something drastic happens and then things have to rapidly respond or go extinct.